Hi, everybody. Of course, the photo you just saw is me without my wig. So. <laughs> what is a revolution? To me, it's something or anything that happens suddenly and results in a marked change. When we think of revolutions, we usually think of popular uprisings, bringing down corrupt governments. Some of the greatest adventures in my own life happened through revolutions. One of them happened to be an actual one. I was doing a solo climb of Mount Aconcagua, not so far from here, just five days before the Egyptian revolution of 2011 began. On the 28th of January, I was doing a load carry from Camp 1 to Camp 2, completely oblivious of what was going on back home. But I had this eerie sensation that something was wrong. And so I picked up my sat phone and called pretty much everybody that I knew, but I couldn't get through. And so I thought the problem was with my sat phone. And when I got back down to base camp and a more reliable connection, I found Egypt front page news of pretty much every website on the planet. Protesters were in the streets trying to bring down a 30-year dictator. Thugs had broken out of prison and were wreaking havoc in the streets. I felt both frightened for my family and very strongly that I wanted to be home to be part of this movement. But I had half my stuff stranded all across the mountain. I'd sunk in weeks and months preparation into this climb, and I didn't even if, know if I could catch a flight back home. But I had to make a decision. I decided to keep on climbing and make a difference one way I knew how. To take a new Egyptian flag to the top, one that I wrote on Egypt is for its people. But the mountain wouldn't relent so easily. On the eve of the summit climb, a hundred knot winds snapped the poles of my tent, forcing me to spend the night in a dilapidated wooden shelter. If actually if it wasn't for that shelter, I'd be completely done for. On the summit climb itself, it was excruciatingly hard. Lacking sleep and now forced to do the climb in just 10 days, I was exhausted and poorly acclimatized. I think I was one of the last people to make it to the summit that day. I'm on the top of South America. It's been an epic, epic day. It was a very emotional moment for me, and I was, as I was walking down, it gave me a chance to reflect, and I realized that my entire life had been a series of revolutions, each one adding to the person that I am today. It struck me that the true revolutions of my life had been internal, and I'd like to share just three of them with you today. From the moment I came into this world, personal revolutions that would shape my life came at me unexpectedly. You see, I was born to two mentally handicapped sisters, which meant that I had a very different childhood growing up. As my friends were out having a good time, I had to stay home and take care of my sisters. At that age, I didn't appreciate it, and I, I, I didn't like it so much. But still, at a very young age, I was cognizant of the fact that my parents had gone through so much, and I didn't want to add, that, add to that. So I became increasingly introverted, deciding to keep all my problems bottled in internally, which wasn't a good thing, but perversely served me very well on expeditions later on when a great deal of mental toughness was required. And then at a very young age, I wasn't very good at sports and actually became severely asthmatic at age 11. The uh, illness prompted me to take up running and um, I started running six days a week. Within weeks and months, I stopped using some of the inhalers the doctors had prescribed, something that actually started a sequence of events that got me to climb my first mountain in Switzerland at the age of 16 and fall madly in love with it. I remember when I reached the top of that mountain in Switzerland for the first time, it was the first time I realized that if you work hard in something, if you persevere, you can actually change the cards you're dealt in life. And it was also the first time that I dreamed of climbing Mount Everest. It seemed like a distant dream, especially for somebody who hailed from the desert. And everybody close to me actually made it their personal mission to point that out. <laughs> but I became stubborn with every passing comment. And after years of dreaming and preparation and knocking on 100 doors to secure the funding that I needed, on the 17th of May of 2007, I finally succeeded in becoming the first Egyptian and youngest Arab to reach the top of Everest. But just days after, thank you. Thank you so much. But just days after coming back from this mountain, I started to feel the kind of void that at that time would only be replaced by setting a bigger goal. And so I decided to climb the seven summits, a project I started in 2008 and completed in 2013. Having just become the first Egyptian to reach the, the top of the highest mountain in every continent, I felt literally on top of the world. What's more is I, I headed back 
from Alaska to Miami to reunite with my soulmate, Marwa, and to witness the birth of our firstborn, Tila. The second revolution that I experienced was one that was actually told recently on the Humans of New York blog over a series of five posts. Uh, this is actually the first time I tell this story in front of a live audience. My experience doing the interview with Brandon Stanton of Humans of New York taught me so much about the power of vulnerability and sharing your true authentic self and emotions with others. I went from telling the story to just five people to sharing it with millions. So like I was saying, I was in time home just for the, in time for the birth. On the 17th of June, I was holding my wife's hand as she gave birth to our baby Tila. Five days later, I was holding her hand, but this time in the intensive care unit, as the doctors tried to resuscitate her time and time again. I remember this voice saying, we'll try one last time, and I begged them to keep on trying. But then I heard that same voice say, time of death, and then that voice just trailed off. And then they left me in the room to say my final goodbyes. What do you do in a moment like this? I was like a madman. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I kissed her hand, I kissed her face. I, I said all the things that I thought I had an entire lifetime to say. I remember asking for strength and, and also asking for a swift death. As I walked out of the intensive care unit, I was nothing, not even a shell of a man. The days, weeks, and months to come were full of darkness, and I felt my, rum, my, my life literally crumble around me. My business that we built together seemed just weeks away from, from completely falling apart. Um, it, was a very difficult, uh, it was a very difficult moment, but sometimes, even in the middle of darkness, you realize uh, that there is light. It can grow, sometimes ever so slowly. And it was then that I remembered a project that she had started a long time ago where she would collect uh, used toys for orphans. And I decided that in her memory that I would try and start this initiative where I'd collect 200 toys during the holy month of Ramadan. Within five days, I hit my target. So I said, why not collect 500? And I hit that in a week. And then 1,000, and then 2,000. And then something amazing happened. Toys just started flowing from everywhere, from China, from Sweden, from the States. Before the end of the year, we had five chapters in five different countries. We'd received a grant and one humanitarian project of the year. I'm now proud to say that Marwa Fayez Toyron, as it became known, is now a registered charity, having touched the lives of tens of thousands of children all around the world. Sometimes when I'm working on the project, when I'm with these kids, I can feel her angelic presence around me. It feels that she's proud of the work that I've done and that she's smiling down. That also makes me smile. After the success of the tour, and I was finally able to go back to work and now working 15 hours a week. And it actually made me revisit an old ambition of completing the Explorer's Grand Slam, which meant that I had to ski to both the North and South Pole. I immediately started preparing, but everyone close to me said, don't do it, it's, it's too early. And in many ways, they were right. In Antarctica, the long days, unchanging scenery, and just desolate environment just completely wore my mind down. Every day, I would get out of camp, start skiing, and I would be hit by this whirlwind of negative emotions. I would literally be skiing and crying at the same time. But then something strange happened. Just all of a sudden, suddenly, these emotions would be replaced by this almost absurd euphoria, and then nothing at all. Sometimes I remember someone would yell stop, and then I would realize that my mind had just been still for almost two hours. In those moments, it felt like I could keep skiing for days. I made the South Pole in great form. To be very honest with you, I, I thought then that this was some kind of brilliant triumph over the mind. Like here I am, this broken man, and I've reached this incredible place. I felt that maybe after all the suffering, after all this pain, I had finally done enough digging, had shed enough layers to get one step ahead of my troubled mind. But nature has this habit of teaching us life's most important lessons. And, <coughs> sorry. And 
And it so happened that the last adventure would be provide the hardest lesson of all, which is actually my third revolution. And actually, uh, my guide on that expedition is here with us in the audience, Bengt. <laughs> so, so, one thing to mention is that um, one of the first gifts that my wife gave me was this toy Smurf. And actually became a defining element of our relationship. When she passed away, uh, the toy Smurf and I became inseparable. I would take it everywhere when I traveled. I would sleep next to me. Somehow, if the Smurf was close to me, she was close. Somehow, I hadn't lost everything. Having done so well in the South Pole, I thought the North Pole would be a breeze. It would just be a matter of time to get there. But on day two, we had a very, very difficult storm and almost no visibility. We're walking through um, you know, a tough blizzard, navigating crevices. And finally, we had to put up tent in very, very difficult conditions. When I finally got into my tent, I looked through my clothes and I couldn't find the Smurf. I went frantic. I started turning the tent upside down and I, then I realized it wasn't there at all. I had to go out there and find it. But how do you find a blue and white Smurf in the middle of an Arctic blizzard? I did that anyway. I, I went right into the, the storm tried to maintain eye contact with Cam just to avoid a lead opening up, splitting us away from our team, and that could prove fatal. I started skiing very fast, looking back at camp every now and then. And then after a few minutes, I realized the futility of what I was doing. I couldn't see the tracks anymore. And I just fell to my knees again, started crying and screaming really loud. I had just lost this little toy, but it felt like I was experiencing the same loss again. And here I was just, within moments, I was broken once again. When I went into my sleeping bag that day and I was sleeping, it, it hit me. That there are no accidents in life. Somehow, I was losing this one thing, the last thing that I was holding on to in a moment that I needed it the most. Life was trying to tell me something. It occurred to me that I needed to learn to let go. I needed to understand that our connection transcended the material world, that it would never be severed. I needed to understand how to love without attachment. I needed to understand that now she had her journey, and for now I had mine. I learned so much in the Arctic that day, and adventure has taught me so much in this life about letting go, about being vulnerable, about being more of the person that I can be, more of the man that she knew that I could be. My experiences made me realize that we're actually all here in this world for one purpose alone, to heal and to help others heal as well. My journey recently took me to the Amazon and a medicine man who told me this beautiful story as a parting gift. The story touched me deeply, and today, in my parting words, I would like to share this story with you. This is a true story that happened 250 years ago in the Great Plains of North America. This is a story about a medicine woman. Her name is Wukashni. She was a healer for her people. One day, a young boy stepped out of his teepee and walked along the grassy plain up the arroyo. When he reached the top of the creek bed, he heard a mournful sound, weeping and wailing. He followed that sound up the creek bed until he saw an old man standing in the water, weeping inconsolably. He was shattered and tattered in every way. The young boy looked at the old man and said, old man, what's wrong? The old man replied, I have this knife. It cuts me every time I touch it. It cuts all those who come near me. It has caused me nothing but sorrow in my life. So the young boy looked at the old man and said, well, why don't you get rid of it? The old man replied, I can't do that. I might need it sometime. So the young boy looked at the old man and said, well, you can give it to me. 
So the old man gave the young boy the knife and he danced away into the hills, clicking his heels. <sighs> he was gone. 30 years later, 30 years later, a young girl stepped out of her lodge and walked along the same grassy plain up the arroyo. When she reached the top of the creek bed, she heard a mournful sound, weeping and wailing. She followed that sound up to the creek bed until she found an old man standing in the water, weeping inconsolably. He was shattered and tattered in every way. The young girl looked at the old man and said, Old man, what's wrong? The old man replied, I have this knife. It cuts me every time I touch it. It cuts all those who come near me. It has caused me nothing but sorrow in my life. The young girl said, why, why don't you get rid of it? The old man replied, I can't do that. I might need it sometime. The young girl was about to tell the old man to give her the knife, but then she remembered her grandmother, Wukashni, and she said, come back with me to the village. My grandmother is a healer. She can help you. Let's go back and talk to her. The old man said, let's go. And they walked back hand in hand towards the village. And when they neared the lodges, Wukashni saw them and came out to greet them. And as soon as the old man saw Wukashni, he came up to her and said, I have this knife. She said, yes. I know. And then she turned to her granddaughter and said, Oh, my granddaughter, you have done so well to bring me this man, but this is not for you. Go back to your lodge and play with your friends and have some food, and I will talk to this man. And then she turned, the granddaughter left, and then she turned to the man who walked up to her again and said, I have this knife. And she said, Yes, I know, and I will take it from you, but not like this. I will hold out my palm and you the knife just above it. And when you're ready to let go, when you're really, really ready to let go, let go. The man held the knife above her palm and then he started to shake. And then he started to weep and then he howled like a wolf. Then he weeped some more. And finally, he was able to let go of the knife. But before the knife would touch her palm, it exploded and turned into light and went everywhere. This is what happens when we let things go. They turn into light and they go everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. If all my experiences have told me one thing, it's that I know so little. Life has taken so much from me, but now I understand that the universe has its own way of ultimately being fair and benevolent. I know now that I'm on the right track, and I'm committed to this journey. I'm now, I can now confidently say that I'm ready for my next set of revolutions. Thank you very much. <laughs>